You're listening to The Broken Meeple Show, a podcast that speaks passionately about board games for the benefit of those who play them. My name's Luke Hector, best known for The Broken Meeple YouTube channel, and I'm an everyday gamer just like you. And I'll be talking about reviews, top tens, and just about anything that connects me to board games. As long as I have a tea or coffee in hand, that is. So grab a cup, relax, and enjoy. And remember, it's only a game. Hi everyone, this is Luke Hector on the, what's this, the 5th of July 24, recording episode 96, and yeah, it is a little bit early that I'm recording this, because you'll notice that that's a Friday, not a Sunday. Well, on this occasion, I needed to get the podcast done early, because I'm going home to visit my parents for my dad's birthday this weekend, so I'd have no time to do the podcast on the weekend, and I wouldn't be free until at least probably middle of next week to record it then. So rather than do it late, I'm doing it early, so that it can be ready to upload pretty much on the what one hour spare I get on Sunday, and then at least I haven't got to worry about recording it. But to be honest, there's not a huge amount to do in this episode, so this might be a bit of a shorter one than most. I think it's time to ask the Patreons for some more ideas, I think, for the uh, podcast. But yeah, generally, update-wise, um, not too bad. Health-wise, uh, you know, certainly the throat thing never resurfaced. Uh, the summer has actually quietened down a little bit. We had that one day of a heat wave, but then the weather's been reasonably warm but not too warm and lately we've just had a couple of days of rain including today and it's cooled down a bit to the point where it's like hovering around that 20 degree mark maybe just slightly below but there's a bit more of a wind and obviously when the rain comes it cools down a bit in the UK anyway so actually I've been kind of liking it I know a lot of people are like oh I want a nice hot hot blue sky summer well for me I just want to be able to get my house so it doesn't like incinerate me every time I get out of bed or go into bed frankly and it's been doable it's been doable to actually cool the house down so what are we in now the start of July well we still got the rest of July and August yet so there's still plenty of time for the weather to uh throw me a spanner in the works but um, we'll see how things go and then I'll just have to cool down in the autumn when I go to Western for Germany and when I go to the Arctic Circle in December because that is still on the cards um, in terms of the blog itself, not bad lately, actually. We're all up to 23, 687, so we're uh, hurtling along towards the 25,000 milestone that I'm aiming for at the moment. But mainly, there's not been a huge amount of video content because, frankly, there's not been a lot to review. I mean, I have got the Peacemaker's Horrors of War review to edit, but I've only just got to the point where I can kind of get that ready because I still need to double check when the embargo for talking about it is they kind of said don't do it until about late-ish July so I'm gonna touch base and find out when I can put that out but what I have done though is that I did a half year overview where just like last year I basically look at the first six months of 20 in this case 24 and just give my impressions of surprises disappointments anticipated you know just like how's the year gone so far and look at that 11,000 views I wish I could get that on every single video but uh yeah, not gonna knock it. 411 likes, 13 people who just can't, who just like to troll me. And that video is doing well and still going strong. So thank you for everybody who's watching it. And the other one is that I have just started a new series called Best and Worst. I came up with the idea on, I think, the half year overview, maybe a video before. And what it basically is, is it's kind of a different take on top tens. Not to say that I'm going to stop doing top tens, but I think top tens are going to be a bit less frequent now. Not, you know, not because I don't enjoy them, although they do take a while to edit, much like these ones do. But the thing is, I did a little kind of little survey as somebody on uh, one of my comments mentioned that top tens were starting to get stale. Not my personally top tens, just top tens in general. Like people are starting to get a little bit you know, bored with seeing the same like, oh, here's 10, here's 10 games of which we don't care about the bottom five and then the top five are worth talking about. And I asked a question on a couple of other things like the Gaming Rules Slack channel and, and the like to sort of go, is that actually the case? Are top tens actually getting somewhat you know are they getting stale are we actually now at a point where we don't particularly like top 10 lists and it's like okay i'm curious about that and so far the feedback's been kind of mixed you know some say yeah you know what i'm starting to not really watch top 10s anymore and others are like no i still like watching them every now and again so and to be honest i find myself not watching a lot of them at the moment not because i don't like them but because you know, some of the people that I used to watch top 10s for just don't do top 10s anymore. So there's nothing there. 
but also uh, even the Dice Tower Top 10s. You know, I don't really watch them anymore, usually because, as I said, the you had the original trio, and then you had the trio with, you know, Z, Tom, and Delisio, and those trios worked great on screen, great chemistry. I'm sorry, but, you know, there hasn't been any trio of good chemistry that has brought me into the top 10 since Mike sort of left and went further up north. But also the topic ideas are just getting a little bit weird. I mean, the last one they did was a, was it games beginning with A? As if anybody cares. Why would, why would that be interesting? What is the, what is the point of caring whether the games be begin with a certain letter or not? And that's not what I want to do. I don't want to do top 10s that are, you know, that are topics that aren't of any use to anybody. So, but then I'm also running out of, you know, potential top 10 ideas. So what the whole point of this series was, was to go, well, okay, well, what if I talk about my favorites and worst from specific things I would normally do on a top 10 list? Because doing top 10 of a publisher or designer is quite tricky when you haven't either played 10 games that they've done, or maybe they haven't even released 10 games that they've done. You know, they might not even have that many games. And also you might just end up going through their entire catalog anyway. So the idea was that in order to not have to do a top 10 for those ones, I do this best and worst, which is where I talk about two, maybe three. I think at the moment it's been three, but it'll fluctuate depending on the topic. Where I just talk about my two or three worst examples of what they've done and my two or three best examples of what they've done. So I did recently a, a Stonemire one here, the best and worst of Stonemire. 6,700 and still climbing. I mean, and I expected this to be a lot lower on the uh, likes and dislikes because there's a lot of Stonemire fanboys out there, but even the ones who disagreed with what I had to say are still liking the video and talking about it, which is fantastic, you know. So this has already gone down well, maybe not quite up to the caliber of some of my earlier top 10s, but it's still doing pretty good. And I've got another one that I'm hoping to release today, actually. You know, I when did this one come out? This came out on June the 30th. So I've got one that I'm almost done editing. I just need to finish off of the music and render it, and then I will get it uploaded tonight. Um, and that is the best and worst of Uwe Rosenberg. So you, that one should have already released for a couple of days by the time you listen to this podcast. And the idea is that I think publishers and designers will be good topics for these. Occasionally mechanics, like best and worst of area control or something like that, for example. And then what could happen is that my top tens could be on more esoteric ideas, not silly things like, you know, 10 games beginning with the letter T or something. But, you know, maybe like, for example, I want to do a top 10 list on uh, top 10 tips for uh, running a game club. You know, because I I used to run a game club. I used to run the Portsmouth one. I kind of co-run uh, the Southampton club along with my uh, mate Russell. So, you know, and, I mean, we don't technically have a hierarchy system, but it's really us two that kind of like do a lot of the stuff. And, you know, the idea is, is that, you know, I have been to these two clubs. I have run essentially half of these, you know, one of these clubs and half of the other. And I've been to other clubs as well, and I've seen good and bad stuff arise, particularly in my Portsmouth one, you know, where I used to, you know, that used to be run by someone else. Then I took over running it. Uh, then uh, two of us co-ran it. And then I just didn't have the time and I wasn't liking the way the club was going. And I just basically gave the, you know, the, the running to the other person. And yeah, the, that club has fluctuated up and down in terms of what I think works and what doesn't work. And I think that's going to be a useful top 10. But that's the idea. Top 10s are going to be on more of those sort of topics rather than just top 10 Uwe Rosenberg games. Yeah, the best and worst, I think, is just a little bit more palatable. And then people can get not only stuff I'm going to talk praise about, but given I do like to speak my mind, I would like to talk about games I don't like as well. So talking about my worst examples also does well and people can discuss discuss and debate. So, so far the series is going good. We'll see how the Uri Rosenberg one does and uh, by all means let me know your feedback as I do each video uh, as to whether you're enjoying the series or not and you know, we'll see what other ideas I can get on there. I mean they will predominantly I think be publisher and designer. Occasionally they might do a mechanic one but I think publisher and designer works quite well. Uh, I wouldn't mind doing a check game additions one that would be good for the next publisher one. Uh, designer, maybe Vladimir Suhi. Uh, we've played a bunch of his games, so that might be a good potential one. So yeah, there's plenty of ones to do down the line. But yeah, they're the only two videos I did since the last podcast because there just hasn't been a lot of videos. I mean, look at this, June 23rd, June 27th, June 30th. I mean, I haven't had a lot of time because work has been 
really really tough uh, the summer for me is very difficult for work because a lot of the stuff that normally i would have to do in december to file like tax returns gets done in the summer because that's when the audit team does a lot of those accounts but they all have deadlines and i have other other you know other things to do at work and so the summer becomes fraught with work i mean i've done a lot of extra hours in the last few weeks and those extra hours suck into time that i could be doing stuff with the blog so it is a a hit and miss affair but as i as the year goes on there's going to be more stuff to review you know i've got dog park with the expansion there will still be two videos on those coming out once i've uh, given the game a bit more beans and played the solo mode a little bit peacemakers as i say will be another video to do but yeah there's only so much extra content and there's been nothing to review lately i mean nothing has released in the uk for i think the last month at least in terms of releases, maybe month and a half, like no game has released that I've got any interest in. I mean, I even bought a copy of uh, Sand from uh, Dever Games. Um, I've got the pronunciation, whatever, but you know, D-E-V-I-R. And, you know, I bought that one, but I just can't find myself wanting to play it. I mean, uh, you know, I, I it was mainly just as a kind of whim. I needed to, you know, buy like 50 quid's worth of stuff and i just thought yeah let's throw it in you know a mate of mine said that he tried it wanted to try it more i'm sure we'll get to play it at some point but i've read the rules to it and i look at it and it's just like this looks like a pretty boring pick up and deliver game but we'll see if it's any good and it's just not appealing to me and there's just not a lot of games that are being released at the moment that are appealing we're in the dry driest part of the year and until gen con comes around we're not going to see anything particularly new released and even then we need to get closer to sm so yeah so sorry that there's not been a ton of content but hopefully you're enjoying these best and worst videos and of course uh i'll get more content out as we go along so fair enough on that right let's talk about free games that i have played and two of these are going to be pretty short because there's not much to say about them and one of them's a bit more interesting let's talk about uh let's talk about the weirdest one first a friend of mine uh, who i normally play now context here i normally play heavy euros with this person okay all right we tend to play you know they, they like some lighter games and one of them i'm actually going to talk about a little later in this episode but yeah we we do play some lighter games but for the most part we play the the heavier euros and to see this game in his ham worried me slightly because oink games don't tend to do a lot of games that are you know very heavy in nature because they're all tiny boxes and this is a game called dro polter dro polter i don't know where dro polter the actual name comes from um but it's uh this was like a weird little party game and i thought okay this is really strange to see him with an oint game but okay i'll bite let's see it's, it looks short this and i kid you not this is what the game is right you have a hand of five items, a red plastic cube, a blue wooden key, uh, a yellow, what looks like a bit like a rice cracker, um, a white like silver clamshell, and something else, and a ring, a plastic ring, like you would get out of like a juicy pop or whatever those, uh, one of those like fun pops or something that you used to get as kids back in the uh, 90s. But, you know, you've got these items in your hand and then these these little metal bells that you can have which could end up there eventually the idea is is that each round someone flips the top card of a deck and the idea is is that whatever is pictured on the card you have to drop out of your hand but nothing else and if you have the bells which are victory points if you win a round you get a bell in your hand you also have to not drop the bells otherwise you lose those victory points and that's pretty much the game you just have rounds after rounds going through the deck of cards where this card, for example, tells you to drop all four of these items and you have to somehow drop them out of your hand, but you only get to use the hand they're in. So I can't drop them out. Of, I can't use any other means of getting them out of my hand. You have to kind of just jiggle your hand around, move the fingers, do some crafty like, you know, dexterity with your fingers in order to drop the particular items now it's stupidly easy when there's only one item typically and even then that tends to be random as to who wins that because it really just depends but you effectively have to shake the items in your hand between two hands first and then clench a fist and then open the fist and start trying to draw them where the items end up in your hand after doing that will dictate your chances of winning it basically so it is just a silly little party game but yeah this is weird <laughs> this is just weird i mean i don't know who came up with the concept of this game you know whether he was like a little bit high at the time but the fact that my friend had this, I mean, a, a, a guy who plays heavy Euro games, pretty much never plays party games, and for some reason bought this. Like, he saw it being demonstrated, or he saw it on the thing, and just thought, this sounds ridiculously silly, let's just have a laugh with it. And Oink games aren't cheap. 
So it really did shock me that he had this. Do I hate it? No, it is what it is. It's a silly little party game. The, the problems I had with it was I won the game by kind of cheesing it a little bit because you're meant to get to five bells. That's the automatic winner. But when you get to three bells in your hand, it becomes insanely difficult to separate the bells from all the other pieces. And if you drop a bell, you lose the bell permanently and have to get it back again. So there's no incentive to get to five. I got to four by fluke. A card came out that only wanted one item and it was at the top of my hand. I was able to drop it easily. So I got to four bells, right? If I tried to drop any, if I tried to do any of the other cards since that point, I would have lost bells because there's no way I could have done it to get to five items. You have to be a dexterity master in order to do it. It's too hard. Added to the fact that because your hand gets sticky and clammy as the game goes on, all the items made out of plastic and that basically stick to your hand. So, you know, you're trying to dislodge the red cube, but you can't because it's partially wedged between two fingers and it's sticking to your fingers, which means you can't physically dislodge it. So, you know, that becomes a bit of a problem as the game goes on. So I ended up winning it by literally just not really trying whilst I got four bells in my hand because I knew nobody else around the table was going to get to four bells because they were constantly trying to usurp themselves or so usurp others and surpass themselves. And every time they tried, they just ended up dropping their bells. So it it's kind of a weird little game. It can be a bit cheesed, but it is what it is. It's a simple little party game that is a bonkers idea I think somebody literally just had a bunch of random pieces in a sock drawer or something and just decided how can we make a game out of this and so they did but it's another one that eh, it does what it does I don't really care about it I, I, I'm not seeking it out or whatever you want something that's a little bit funny to play with your kids then by all means grab this but serious gamers aren't going to play this that often although <laughs> the four of us are serious gamers and we ended up playing it so it wasn't exactly the first thing I expected him to pull out on game night but it's quick it's fast i wouldn't say it was cheap because it's oink games it is what it is what what do i need to say it's a silly little dexterity game and i don't go mad for dexterity games but this exists so <laughs> give it a look if you want something to entertain your kids i think all right let's take a swig of green tea mm. and that's green tea mixed with some white marble honey. Uh, one of my viewers um, um, very kindly sends me a lot of honey jars and in big bulk from Greece because I love honey, you know, in all shapes and sizes. I mean, I love mead. You know, mead is pretty much on par with cider now as like the two main drinks I love, but in terms of alcohol. But yeah, I, I love honey. So he sends me very kindly a bunch of honey from Greece and they come from a mixture of his stores, but also from various people he knows who run their own beehives. So I got a jar as one of them, which had no label on it, no label at all. It just literally had nothing on the label and it was just solid honey. And we're talking solid. Like you have to carve into it in order to do it. It is not runny honey, but it was apparently called white marble honey. And apparently it's a delicacy in Greece, but it tastes quite nice and it still stirs into my tea. So I got a little bit in there, but all these other honeys, a mixture of hard and runny honeys. I mean, it's as presents and gifts go, it's amazing. So I love it when he does send me them. You know, thank you very much. But um, it's it's just like, you know, all this honey that I've got that I can just eat as I go along and trying all these different ones. It is really nice. But yeah, the, it just kind of seemed weird. Anyway, I'm um, getting off topic. Let's move on to the second game. Um, as much as I can say, look, it's a harmless little dexterity game with a bunch of little pieces out of your sock drawer. It is what it is. This one, though, I don't know what it's trying to be. I mean, this one, I think, won some award or got nominated for some award in Australia. That's what I heard. I thought I read it somewhere that it did. Has Australia got a low bar for games? Because I'm a little bit concerned now. This is called Aethermon Collect. I saw it at the UK Games Expo. Didn't, like, willingly grab it. I think I just got given one. And it's basically... I mean, it... <laughs> I feel like Pokemon is going to sue somebody at this point because it basically is Pokemon the card game. And all you do in this game, and I kid you not, this is the game, right? These cards, which basically look like they've got Pokemon. In fact, some of these creatures look pretty much like ripoffs of Pokemon. I mean, look at this one, Machka here. I'm pretty certain in Pokemon there is a Firefox of some description and that looks mighty similar to it. And anything with a green like forest spider in it, uh, you know, deserves nothing. But, you know, this is literally just a small box, a bunch of these cards, a few little artifacts that give you like a once per game ability. And the rules are written on cards. 
So you don't even get a rule book. They're written on cards that you have to keep in order and flip over. I mean, that's already a little bit of a, oh, Christ. But all you do in this game, and I kid you not, this is all you do. They're laid out in a grid. You have this character model in the middle. And then you move the character model as far as you like in a row and pick up the card. Okay? And the cards basically come in various different suits and they're worth one, two, or three points. And you're basically trying to collect sets. You can play at co-op where you have to like do, you have to kind of like go through the tableau and get so many cards, you know, without going bust. But then you've also got the competitive mode, which is you're trying to get sets. And that's literally it. I mean, here's the typical setup. So I could move this guy to the left, take this uh, Languana or whatever that is over there. Then somebody else moves it uh, south and takes this Tortok over here. Then somebody else moves it over there, takes this Raider. And then basically just keep going like a Rook in chess and collect cards for sets. 15, 20 minutes, and that's the game. That's it. That literally is the entire game. Okay. Um... Am I missing something here? I mean, it's weight 1.00 on board game. In fact, has that actually got anybody voting on it? Three people have voted on whether this is a light game. And of course it's a light game. So three people have voted on this. That makes it weight one out of five. Like literally one out of five. But this game is boring. There's nothing in this game. It's two to four players. And you basically just move this thing around and collect cards for sets. The competitive mode is just outright dull. The co-op's a little better, but I couldn't really entertain people for more than about five minutes of playing this game before they got bored. You know, this I get that there's a market for these tiny little similar games and that, but then why wouldn't you play something like Love Letter? I'd rather play Love Letter if you want like a little micro game that's super quick and has some interesting choices in it. At least it has an element of bluffing, a little bit of deduction in it. This one is literally just move a piece, you know, up, down, left, and right and collect cards for sets. You know, the other detail on the card is meaningless. It doesn't matter what the name of the animal is. It, they don't have special abilities or anything. You've got these little artifacts that give you a once per game ability, but even they're not particularly interesting. It's just... It just it doesn't do anything. There's like... This is... This is kind of like your typical thing that you sometimes find at UK Games Expo. A small game done by, you know, indie people, which fair enough, you know, they, they put their heart and soul into a game. And I suppose it's, a, you know, partially a dick move for me to be talking bad about it. But uh, I say it how it is. I just didn't get any enjoyment out of this. I mean, this is on par with something like A Gentle Rain. Yeah, I said it. I'm getting sick and tired of A Gentle Rain being talked about all the time on solo things. But I'm sorry, but this Gentle Rain game is boring and tedious and I don't like this one either I mean most of your ability to win this game is based on random draw so where is the puzzle where is the fun but nobody people on the solo Facebook groups just won't shut up about this game I've done a review of it ages ago in lockdown when I had horrible hair and beard at that point and yeah I wasn't kind to the game you might want to watch that before you get hype sucked into this hype of a gentle rain just because I think it got released at Target or something but uh, I digress A for Mon Collect I mean, it's nice artwork, but that's it. And I'm surprised that Pokemon aren't going to have a go at you. So, uh, yeah, it exists. But I haven't heard anybody say it's a great game. And if I was reading it right, that it had some award nomination in Australia. Australia, you have something to answer for. You really do. All right, well, let's talk about something a little bit more um, interesting. And that is Tanto Cure. Uh, is it Cure? Cure? I oh, know, I'm just going to call it Tanto. And the idea is, is that this is a game that I'd wanted to play for a little bit because a friend of mine has a game called Heart of Crown, which is similar in terms of this anime style theming. And the idea is, is that it's a deck builder that plays very much like Dominion. Um, this is Heart of Crown, by the way. So you, you play it pretty much like a Dominion game, except that there's a bit more variety with the cards and you have these princesses that give you some really cool power once you get to a point in the game when you can get one. All right. Tanto Quo is the is kind of like a spin-off or something that's fairly similar to it. I think it's done by the same people as well. And it's got this typical artwork for anime styles. However, you might just have to bear a little bit with the theme because the theme is is Jap is basically anime maids. Yeah, that basically all the cards are girl maids, you know, female maids of typical Japanese anime style portraits. So, you know, think of the the slightly over-the-top sexualized version of these things. I mean, they don't hold back. Um, I mean, there's no, like, ma massive nudity in the game, as far as I'm aware. But, the, um, you know, they are definitely 
it is that artwork. You know what Japanese artwork is like for this kind of thing. But the idea is, is that you have a bunch of these laid out, which are, you know, chambermates. So these have special abilities and they allow you to do things like you do in Dominion, like draw cards and get extra buys and uh, have more currency. I mean, it's, it is basically a deck builder. But the with the expansions that have come out you've got all these different maids that you can pick from and the slight twist is that depending on which expansion you use you know you might have one expansion that lets you do things like you know discard a bunch of cards up to a value of whatever to get points and these bonuses but the first set we played i think had us uh similar to the heart of crown game it basically had us doing oh what was it that i can't remember what they were called but they were like super maids they were basically like really powerful maids and you were able to basically uh acquire these and these had special powers but they they changed as the game went on like there was a deck of them and you could go right through them i'm not seeing much in the way of gameplay from these images more just people dressed up as maids at conventions that's kind of want to see the uh, kind of an image of the board so yeah you would just have these decks out they come in small boxes you buy these love cards because you're effectively showing love to these maids okay <laughs> interesting and they're one two and three much like the silver bronze and gold in dominion so as you can say there's a lot of similarities but that's pretty much the game it is a deck builder so you buy these maids you have to you have to um, these other maids that you can get out of your deck, but in order to do so, you need a certain uh, like resource to do it. You can buy these different maids. They all got special abilities, and you play it like a kind of pseudo Dominion game. And honestly, it's fine. Yeah, I like it. I mean, you get past that whole weird sort of setting that the game is. And to be fair, I watch enough animes and I've seen uh, enough of this over-sexualized stuff in anime. I mean, I'm a big fan of Fairy Tale, and which I'm looking forward to the um, 100 Years Quest series that's coming out in a couple of days. But yeah, if you've watched Fairy Tale and a couple of others, yeah, they go a little bit over the top with the way that they personify women in it. But I mean, that's anime for you. It's something we're just used to. And let's face it, all the guys are depicted as like, you know, whiny pretty boys all the time. So it's not like it's a one-sided argument. But, you know, this game is fine. It's a very quick game. We we played it, the same group that was playing Droll Polter and that. And it's, you know, it, it's amusing what, they, what the names of these maids are and the flavor text of them. You know, it certainly leads to a few innuendo jokes and uh, some in-gags. But the game is a straightforward deck builder, and with the different maids and expansions that you have, you can create some cool combos and different like settings for the game. But it's not quite as varied as something like Heart of Crown. So this one is a little bit more linear in how it does, uh, although they have released quite a lot of sets for it, so I suppose that helps with the variety aspect. I'm not sure how many different maids are in a particular expansion set. I mean, we play with a lot of them like, you know, 10 different maids in every game we played. We played two separate games, but I don't know if there's, like, 20 maids in a box or whether you do just get the 10 maids. It's... I'm not entirely certain, but, yeah, the game played fine. It was a fine deck builder, you know, raced a race to get to the, uh, the you know, to end the game and see who's got the most points. Uh, games are close. Um, there's definitely uh, close scoring, and I'm seeing a lot of cards that I don't recognize here in terms of um, abilities and that. So I just wonder how many sets has been released to this. I mean, maybe some of these are fan expansions. I don't know. Uh, my version. Oh, right. Okay. <clears throat> Take a drink. Yeah, so some of these are fan versions. But you know, I can imagine fans are uh, making some interesting stuff with this. But yeah, I enjoyed it. It's not something that I would go hunt out and buy. Um, I think there are better deck builders. And I'm not sure how many people I would be able to entice into this theme. And if I'm going to play something like this, why not just play Dominion, I guess, or maybe even the Heart of Crown, frankly. And certainly some of these do have rather small text on the cards so that make it quite hard to read. But if I find a cheap set and I just want to fit it into a space on the shelf, maybe I would grab a copy. It's, you know, it's just a harmless little deck builder. I don't know what this motto tanto core re-implementation is, but, you know, this is the one that I see. These, like, big flashy little boxes, but... Yeah, the game art is in the Japanese anime style and uses the theme of maids commonly seen in anime. All of the cards fit yeah, with dividers and stuff like that. It's just a simple game. It, you know, I'm curious as to, you know, how much buzz it gets these days. I mean, you know, I mean, this is, uh, yeah, Tanto Core. I mean, could blimey, the last video that was done by this was done by Starlet Citadel. This was a YouTube pair that, ah, they were ages ago. Could blimey, they haven't done anything in, yeah, 13 years ago. I mean, this is old school stuff. I mean, this was this was actually yeah a pair of female uh, content creators before the whole thing went out of control since 2020 or something, you know. So this was actually you know ahead of its time, but it's a fun little game, fun little game. 
no, you know, nothing groundbreaking. There are better deck builders, but I enjoyed it. It's a bit of a laugh, and uh, I'm just glad that I finally got to uh, play it. You know, because it had been on the bucket list for a while, because I'd seen it on the shop shelves, and my mates, had, I'd seen my mates playing it. And I just thought, yeah, let's give it a try. You know, I like anime, and so this kind of resonates with me just from the anime theming. But yeah, it's uh, <laughs> definitely an interesting style, to put it that way. Right, well, let's get on to the topic for this video, which is um, not hopefully going to take up too much time, but it's unrelated to everything that I've kind of said. But basically, we have various online means of playing uh, board games. So we have Board Game Arena, we have Tabletop Simulator, and we have, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, Tabletopia. Now, I'm not really going to talk much about Tabletopia because when it comes to the three platforms that I've just mentioned, Tabletopia is easily my worst one by a country mile. Mainly because, not because it doesn't look nice, it is nice to look at, but the interface and the controls for it are absolute garbage. Absolute chronic garbage. Here, it may look pretty, but it's clear that whoever designed this software knows a fair bit about software design, doesn't understand about usability or gaming. So it just, it's too clunky and too horrible to control. And let's face it, I don't hear of anybody looking at Tabletopia anymore. Yeah, hell, even publishers, they don't seem to make a big deal about Tabletopia anymore. So I'm just going to ignore that. So we really have Tabletop Simulator and uh, Board Game Arena. Now, question is, can I actually get on here without having to... Uh, sign into my thing well i might as well sign into it fine password's blocked you can't tell what it is so the idea is is that come on let me in let's be in there yeah, there we go so and tabletop simulator i think we'll just have to go on their home page but let's let's talk about tabletop simulator for the moment so this is basically like a 3d engine like machine thing so you most of the time you would use it to do 3D models of various stuff. But at the moment, it's used a lot to play games. And of course, you had the old stuff like, you know, checkers and chess and all that lot. And there's a few like backgammon here. But the idea is, is that on Steam, people have now taken to making board games on there. And publishers do this a lot. They make, uh, you know, lots of different board games for Tabletop Simulator. And they're basically platforms where all the stuff is 3D rendered on the screen and you use the mouse and keyboard to, you know, to move the camera around and manipulate cards, shuffle them, you know, flip the deck, that kind of thing. And it's done mostly by users. So, yes, the publisher might hire somebody to make the TTS mod for them, but some of these mods might just be done by individuals around the world and they create a decent mod using the imagery from the various cards and stuff. Uh, Board Game Arena on the other hand, is basically a kind of like an online, I don't I don't want to say JavaScript because I'm not a computing expert, but I forget what the computing sort of language is, but this is basically like where you can play a bunch of games on a slightly quicker version than playing it in real life because I, I can't really, maybe I can browse a game actually. So let me take one for example. Let's take, uh, let's take Lost Ruins of Arnak here, right? Okay, so I'll move that one. Now, can I, I should be able to browse a game. If I click on, yeah, if I get into the actual games, here we go. So they got a lot of games on here and they keep adding more games. They have some in beta as well. Now, some of these I've never heard of, Circle of Life, Power Vacuum and all this stuff. But, you know, they have a lot of stuff that you'll recognize here. I mean, you look at this picture here, you know, Race of the Galaxy, Azul, Ticket to Ride, Gaia Project, Sky Team, Seesaw on Paper, uh, Bunny Kingdom, you know, Hadara, Ark Nova. Wingspan, Terrifying Mars, Catan, they've got a lot of them on here. So, why don't we load up my favorite, Ark Nova. Okay, so I should be able to, here we go, yeah, so I can watch a game in progress. This might actually help to illustrate my point. So let's go into a, most people play this two players, uh, progression. Does anybody actually progress? Why do they all say 0%? That just seems weird. Um, I don't know, let's have a look and see if they've actually done anything here. Whoop, here we go. Hopefully that's coming out on the screen fine. If you're listening to this, there's only so much I can tell you. But have they actually... All right, so they are actually getting stuff done. They're just basically starting off. Um, I'm just probably going to turn the sound down, though, because I don't want the sound to come... Actually, no, nah, let's just leave the sound. If you hear the card shuffling, then sorry. 
But basically, yeah, this allows you to do the platform. And so you've got all your stats on the right. You know, I can see what uh, card symbols I've got tags for. Tells you the victory points people are on. Tells you whose go it is with the spinny hourglass and stuff. And then the rest of the game is basically represented on the screen um, by various, you know, card imagery. And so every, every time you click on stuff, it will guide you at the top to allow you to say, right, confirm this. What card? Right, I'm going to select this card. Which card do you want? Okay, it is your turn. What actions do you want to do? In? And you basically point and click. And so the the idea is, is that this allows you to play these big games in a much shorter space of time. Um, I'm going to come out of this because that uh, noise is starting to get annoying. But come on, come out. And so now these... The idea is that, yeah, you can play these games a lot quicker, and you certainly can. I mean, Ark Nova takes like a good three plus hours in real life. Ark Nova can be played in about 60 minutes on here with a two player game. You know, I mean, here it says 53 minutes, and it could even be less than that if you've got some really fast players. But, you know, it, it, it does have, you know, small games and light games as well. And the idea is, is that some of these, the, you can play them ranked or unranked. So you have like this weird ELL, ELO score, I forget what it's called, but basically it's like a star point you get every time you win games and like you could be ranked in the world and who gives a monkey's toss? I mean, seriously, I do not care about ranking myself in the world on games. I don't play any game enough to warrant ranking anything. And it, as soon as you start playing for a competitive edge to try and be the best, suddenly the game stops being enjoyable because somebody has taken it far too seriously. So these are the two platforms that we have, uh, you know, effectively, you know, these are the two main ones. Yes, I know others are available, but they're less common, they're more niche, they might only cater to one or two games. These are the two big ones that is like, that you can't deny that. So the question is kind of basically a, are these any good? Uh, do they ruin the industry? You know, are they a detriment to the industry to have these available? And are they, you know, just generally, are they worth it? Well, let's start with the easy one. Are they ruining the industry? No, <laughs> not really. At least not in, well, it will have an impact. But I don't think it's ruining the industry. Because the thing with these, like, settings here is that, you know, this allows you to test games before you probably want to buy them. And some of these games you're going to want in physical condition. You're going to want the box and all those pieces to move around. Because as much as you have the ability to 3D render them on the tabletop simulator. Or you know, or to have the games represented on the screen here. It doesn't compare to the tactile feeling of grabbing all the pieces. And manipulating them and holding the cards. And especially with some of these games that are pretty component heavy. You know, I mean I get for a card game it's not particularly amazing. But. You know, Great Western Trail, Gaia Project, Terra Mystica, you know, a bunch of these, you know, these core gamers, Distilled, uh, Seasons with those big chunky dice that you see me roll for comedy value. Do you really want to play Seasons on here all the time and never get to roll those dice? Obsession, all those different meeples, Feast of Odin, all those pieces through the ages. I mean, there's a lot of stuff where you might want the tactical experience, so people are still going to have the physical board game. What this does, though, is that allows you a very good way to test the game first before you buy it. You know, I, I might hear about a game that's like, no, oh, I've never really heard of this. Uh, well, let's, I mean, Power Vacuum. What the hell is it? A trick-taking game. Okay. So, all right. So, it's a trick-taking game. That would interest me at first. I've never heard of it. I don't know if it's any good. But I could basically watch the game in progress. Or I could literally just go, you know what? Learn the rules very quickly and just play a game. Unranked. Who cares if you win or lose? It's unranked. And then... I can basically see if it's any good to play. But then it could also be for a game that's already been out for a while. I mean, let's say you are tempted by uh, Wingspan. You've never played Wingspan. You just hear everyone talking about it. Well, come on here. You can learn the rules. I mean, the rules are in PDFs or somebody could hopefully teach you. And you could just play a game of Wingspan and see if it's exciting for you, if the gameplay's good. Yeah, you won't be able to see all the artwork in the game and you certainly won't well you'd see a decent amount of it and you obviously won't be able to get the tactile pieces and see the component quality but you'll be able to get a game done pretty quickly and this also has the advantage of allowing you to be able to play with other people that you don't see at a game club you know it's all right saying oh well you know i could take wingspan to the game night and play four you know i could play four things but uh, sorry four with four people there but what if your friends are over in america and you live in the united kingdom what if you're, you know, what if you're going to play with your family and your family's overseas? What if you're, you know, what if you're at home and you haven't got anybody to play with and you're stuck alone? You don't want to play a solo game. You want to play with people. 
then you would use something like this in order to do it. In Board Game Arena, you don't even have to know the person. I mean, you can certainly build up a friends list, but you can simply just go and play with randoms. Now, that does have a a positive and a negative on that front and you know positive like i say you can play these games whenever you like you can always get them played there'll always be somebody in the world who's going to play it with you so that's not a problem but the negative is you don't know that person if you play it with friends it's not so bad but the thing is this doesn't have as far as i'm aware to take a a specified talk system on it so even with tabletop simulator it's similar you need to use something like discord which is what i tend to use but the thing is Discord is typically more common on Tabletop Simulator because you'll play this with your friends on Tabletop Simulator rather than randoms because there's no matchmaking system for Tabletop Simulator. So this is something you kind of pre-organize in advance. Therefore, you would have a Discord server. You would set up. You would get it, people in the room. And every time me and the mates played on Tabletop Simulator when we haven't got the means to host for the night, then we use uh, microphones and that's fine. Here, though, there isn't a talk system as far as I'm aware, so you are not actually directly talking with the people around the game. There is a chat box, but it's not really that great, and let's face it, you've only got so much time in the game because the the, the game is handling all the stuff so quickly around the screen. If you don't pay attention, you're going to lose what the hell's going on, especially with something like um, you know, Ark Nova or particularly uh, Earth. Earth on here, cool, blimey, you know, you think there's a lot to deal with in terms of the cubes and the cards and that? Well, the system handles it all for you, Granted, it's not the perfect implementation. I think they could tweak a couple of things to make it smoother, but um, I, I like it fine. But yeah, you are kind of rushed off your feet with this. And also, I really don't like the ranking system on this. This whole ELO thing. I hate it. It's not of interest to me. I mean, does it even tell me mine while I'm on here? It's on my favorites. Yeah, here we go. There's ranking. There's 10 people and there's some guy called Song Chen who's apparently in the best in the world from China. And then there's somebody from Antarctica. How the hell do you how the hell do you play a bunch of games from Antarctica? What? And then United States of America, Sweden, da 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 da. Again, I just don't care. I honestly don't. I'm not interested about being the best at the game. I want to play it to enjoy it. So why would I care? And you do get a lot of I've suffice to say, mean people on here. Yeah, this isn't a setup where I think the random players are particularly nice in terms of the community. I mean, look at this. We've got real-time slow etiquette as a topic idea for forums here, which basically is that people get sick and tired of players being slow in this game. It's Ark Nova. It's not something where you can do a turn in less than 10 seconds. It takes time to think about your turn, so you have to accept that there's a little bit of a slowness. But... People just don't really talk to you. I mean, I go on here to play a game of Art Nova. Somebody might turn up. I'll say GG, you know, the, the internet slang for good game. And I get no response back. Nothing at all. And they just play. And they'll play at lightning speed. I'll try to keep up. Sometimes I'm at lightning speed. Sometimes I can't, you know, sometimes I slow down a bit because I'm trying to obviously think about my turn. And, you know, I might get distracted doing other things. And the thing is, is that the... You know, they get to the end, and as soon as you finish the game, they, you know, you don't even get a GG back or well done or anything. They just, they just bugger off. That's it. They just run off, and that's it. But even then, lately, I've seen people on this uh, BGA actually actively tank the game before it ends. Why would you do that? Because of the stupid ELO ranking system. Because it apparently doesn't reward the opponent as much. Or it hurts you less. I can't remember which way around it is. But there's definitely something that impacts if you concede the game early. And also, it means that the points do not tally. Because you might have like high scores. Or like, oh, did you get a low score and that? And there's, I'm sure there's some ranking on here about comparing your highest score and your lowest score. But if you concede the game early, the opponent doesn't get a winning score. So I could be playing Art Nova. We could literally be two turns from the end of the game. Like, we're about to finish the game and find out what the points were on either side. And then literally on my last turn, you know, last turn before I'm about to trigger the end game and possibly win, uh, or likely win, they concede. They concede. I don't get to see what my score was. Because the system automatically just gives me the game and doesn't do the point tally. And in bird culture, that's what we call a dick move, okay? And... There's other examples of just people being very, like, antisocial, being very, like, not violent, but, you know, some verbal abuse has been said by it. I mean, the community on BGA is not good, okay? If you want to... 
I do play on BGA every now and again, but I must admit I haven't played, I, I have spurts where I play it constantly and where I don't play it at all. And certainly I haven't played it a lot lately. Um, it's just, as I say, it's the problem is that the community has kind of been sucky and it puts me off. Plus, I just haven't had much time. But, you know, and there's a bunch of games that I like to play. I mean, this is like the favorites that I have. So, I mean, I typically end up playing Earth, Seven Wonders Duel, Ark Nova. As much as I give Forest Shuffle grief, this does handle the scoring for you. So, I would rather play it on here. I would like to actually try the... Uh, expansion for this on here actually and i mean that's another thing i don't want to buy forest shuffle with the expansion the alpine expansion i hear it fixes the game so i'll play it on here and find out uh through the ages season splendor yeah there's a bunch of games that i do like playing on here and there's obviously others uh dog park <laughs> i mentioned that earlier i can play that but then there's a few others i mean i would play terraforming mars on here uh, tawanaku uh, wingspan obsession obsession is pretty good on here so the problem is, is that i would rather just play with friends on here because knowing that I'm just going to be playing with some soulless random on a lot of the times. And sometimes I get nice people. Sometimes people are chatty in the chat phase. Sometimes they'll laugh with you. They'll crack jokes and stuff. And they'll be, you know, they'll say, good game, well done, you know, you know, and I'll do vice versa if I lose. But, man, they just, you do get some really nasty people on here sometimes. And it is a little bit off-putting. So, I mean, that's Board Game Arena. It It's good. And I don't think it's killing the industry having stuff like this because... You you essentially, yes, okay, you might argue, well, a friendly local gaming store is not going to sell a physical copy of the game if you can just play it online. But like I say, people like to have the physical copy of the game. I mean, yes, I could play, you know, one of these online, you know, a Lacerda game online. I could play Kanban on Tabletop Simulator. But that big game with all the pieces and all that laid out, I want it. So I don't think it... I don't think it really hurts the board game industry that much. And I think the publishers who put their games on here do get some money for it. So it's not like it's doing the publishers any harm. But you can argue that maybe some friendly local gaming stores might su um, suffer as a result. Okay, small addendum here, everybody. Uh, basically, the Wi-Fi cut out in middle of recording. And normally when that happens, I can usually salvage it by bridging the gap. Unfortunately, I finish talking about Board Game Arena and then start talking about Tabletop Simulator. And it doesn't gel well at all, no matter how I try to gel it. So uh, basically, you're now going to come into a point where I've just said that, you know, Tabletop Simulator is based on Steam and that the website doesn't have much for me to look at. And but there is a selection of games that it does showcase on there. And then I start continuing to talk about Tabletop Simulator. So sorry about that. Let's continue. But, you know, oh, this is all right. There's a good list of games on here. And this is just an, a, a selection, right? Like DLC games. I'm not sure why they're specifically DLC games. But the idea is, is that on Steam, basically, a lot of users would have created their own games. So, you know, they've got the models. They've done it. And, it, you know, some of them are scripted. BGA scripts everything. And Tabletop Simulator doesn't always script things. I love it when they do, though. Some game mods where they're scripted so that as soon as you say I'm playing this with four players with this particular map or whatever and it automatically sets everything up for you there is very few things in life that feel as good as that but the the problem with tabletop simulator is a variety there are some good games popular games on tabletop simulator unfortunately because they're based on the publisher doing it as well as maybe some random user doing it you won't be able to find every single game you like on Tabletop Simulator. They just may not be a mod that's created. Maybe they just can't physically create a mod for yeah. You know, I'm not I'm not aware if you can play Frostpunk on Tabletop Simulator. Maybe you can, but I mean I imagine that takes a lot to render and sort out. It's it's you just have to sort of play it by ear. But there are some mods that are fantastic. I mean, there's a brilliant Spirit Island comprehensive mod out there. Uh, there is a Great Western Trail New Zealand mod I found, which is fully scripted and easy to play. I mean, I've played some solo games. I mean, I, I probably won't play the game solo anymore in person. I'll certainly play it with people rather in person. But if I want to kick out a solo mode game, I'll load up the script mod. Because it takes me like a fraction of the time to move, a, you know, to use the controls on that. Especially when it takes, I don't have to set the game up and, you know, actually deal with that side of things and this is an advantage of bga and tts and these online platforms that i don't have to set the game up and this is one thing that i don't like doing with board games and that's setting them up because they take far too long sometimes so that takes out that problem 
Uh, the downside of TTS on top of the variety is that it's a bit more of a learning curve. BGA doesn't take that long to learn the interface and most of the stuff it just involves clicking on a thing on the screen saying confirm or whatever your action is. So it's pretty like intuitive and pretty easy to get through it. And if you're a bit uncertain about a game, just play an unranked teaching game and then it won't matter. But TTS involves you having to get used to the interface. So you need to learn how to uh, manipulate the cameras. You need to know how to like save camera views. You need to understand what the how to flip cards and how to rotate cards and which areas the cards are hidden from view of other players. You then need to be able to like you know click and manipulate pieces on the board. So for example, there's a very good mod for hegemony out there, which I think is also scripted. And I've played some solo games of hegemony using that mod because it's quicker than me setting it up now. Although Maybe that will change now that I've got the insert for it, but I'd have to compare. But the thing is with the Gemini is that you've also got to pick up the meeple pieces and put them around. You know, BGA would have some automatic thing that moves them to a spot on the screen, whereas TTS, you need to physically pick up the piece as if it was your hand and plonk it somewhere. And this involves you having to get used to how the controls work to manipulate the stuff on screen. Now, I've played enough TTS, particularly as we played it a lot during lockdown and COVID, that I'm used to it. So, you know, I know how to use both of these interfaces and TTS in particular. I can deal with the camera controls. Sometimes I need a bit of a refresher, you know, for how to do like save particular camera shots and that. But I'm pretty speedy on my PC because it's got quite a decent amount of RAM and a good GPU pro uh, GPU um, graphics card. And Tabletop Simulator is not the best optimized uh, engine in the world. So you are going to need a pretty... Not, not a stupidly powerful system, but the better your graphics card is and the better your RAM is, the better because it does require a bit of computation and you are definitely going to hear that fan noise out of your PC because it's going to heat everything up in order to render a lot of the 3D imagery. So yeah, it's not the most optimized thing in the world. So just bear that in mind. But the you know Tabletop Simulator has allowed me to play a bunch of heavy games with people that I know so that we can effectively socialize over Discord. And that is the advantage of Tabletop Simulator. You're going to be playing with people that you know and like. Therefore, it's fine. Publishers also use this as a way to kind of demo their games. So occasionally, for some of us in the press and content creation, they've actually said, right, you know, you can come along and we'll arrange a couple of games for you on Tabletop Simulator and you get a feel of the game. You may not necessarily be able to handle the pieces, but when it's a prototype, who the hell cares? You know, so this uh, it has allowed me to get used to games without having to play them. But for the most part, even you know, if I want to play things solo, it can be just quicker to go onto my PC, load up a scripted mod um, and say, yeah, I'll just play this. You know, and I've done it with Spirit Island and, you know, Sentinels and the Multiverse and actually not so much Sentinels because that's pretty quick to set up in real life. But and also Tabletop Simulator is not Tabletop Simulator is a little bit harder to use with card games because you've got to do a bit of manipulation with the cards and stuff like that. If it's not too many cards then it tends to work quite well. Like I say, Great Western Trail New Zealand is pretty good with that, and so was Hegemony. But there's a lot of other ones. Uh, Garfield Games, um, you can get quite a lot of theirs on there, although those vary. A couple of their mods are pretty good, but ones like Wayfarers of the South Tigris just do not work. And a lot of this comes down to who creates the mod. If a publisher creates the mod, typically they hire someone really good to do it, and they test it and test it and test it. But if a random person designs it, it's going to have bugs and some issues, and... Sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you don't, you know, you just have to deal with it. But, you know, I like this as an alternative means to play games. So, yeah, the, you know, these online things are here to stay. I certainly don't think they're killing the industry. I think they allow another means of playing games when you can't otherwise get to a venue to play it. And there are going to be people in the world who are in that situation, whether they like it or not. So you can't say it's destroying the industry because it's like, ah, oh, people will just play online rather than play in person. Not really. The people who play games in person want to play games in person, okay? Yes, I can play Hegemony in on you know on my tabletop simulator, maybe with other people, but maybe just playing it solo with a bunch of 3D rendered stuff. But I've got an E-Raptor UV insert for that game. I love Hegemony. 
you have all the banter between people that you want to be in person with, not over a Discord microphone when playing that kind of game. So yes, I can play it on TTS, but I would much rather play it in person. And that's going to be a lot of the attitudes for a lot of games. Typically, solo games, I like to use Tabletop Simulator and occasionally BGA because it sorts out the setup time. You know, I mean, do you know how long it takes to set up like Hegemony at times? The fact that it does it all for you. I mean, Great Western Trail New Zealand, as I mentioned, perfect example. Setting up Great Western Trail New Zealand is an absolute pain in the ass. So being able to simply go uh, one player and I'd like to be red and I'll start there, please. And then it's done. You know, something that would normally take me 20, 25 minutes is done in like 10 seconds. So <laughs> there is certainly advantages. So I don't think they're killing the industry. I think they're perfectly good platforms. I think Tabletopia just really didn't work with its interface. And as far as I'm aware, that just seems to be dying a slow, painful death. But but BGA and TTS, uh, Board Game Arena and Tabletop Simulator are here to stay. I think they're useful platforms. I'm going to continue to use them. I'm sure a lot of other people are. But I'm pretty sure we'll all still be playing games in the physical world most of the time. So yeah, that's all for me. I'm going to wrap this uh, video up. I'll probably edit it on... Uh, I suppose will I edit it tonight or will I do it on Sunday? I mean, it wouldn't take me too long to it. I think I'll edit it now and get it sorted. And then that way, all I've got to do is upload it on Sunday. That'll be easier. But yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed this podcast with the games I've played and this uh, discussion topic. I think I'm going to be asking the Patreons for some more ideas for the next bunch of episodes because I've uh, kind of run out. Um, but by all means, uh, put some suggestions in the comments if you really want. And hopefully you're enjoying your summer wherever you are. Uh, if you're going to Gen Con, by all means, enjoy that. I won't be there. American convention costs a lot to get there. Maybe in the future we'll find a way to get to an American convention. But to be honest, I don't think Gen Con's high on my bucket list. It just looks too packed, too busy, too expensive. If I want to go to an American con, it would probably be Dice Tower East or Pax Unplugged. I think they're the two that strike me as being A, easier to get to, and B, probably just better in terms of the like how much trade versus how much gaming. Sometime in the future I would like to, but cost is the big problem i mean getting enough holiday from work is one aspect you know it's a long way to travel just for a game convention but as i say it's cost cost is a big deal so we'll see but anyway that's it for me i'm gonna sign off so i uh, hope you're enjoying yourself hope you're enjoying the show let me know your thoughts in the comments uh take care and remember it's only a game love you all and bye for now and enjoy the rest of your weekend